button going. So today we are looking at effective imagery. So uh, this is sometimes referred to as visualization. Um, this is where if you have ever practiced using uh, like a vision board, or if you've ever like put a picture somewhere and like you've you know meditated on it consistently, where you're like you know this is the car that I'm gonna buy in in whatever time, right? Um, you know, that is uh, that is an example of, of using imagery. But if you've also ever just like walked yourself through like a process in your brain before you try to go through that process in reality, uh, that is also a really good example of imagery. So there's a lot of different ways to uh, sort of apply this. And what's amazing is it has been shown to uh, improve uh, skills at a highly effective rate. It has been shown to reduce pain, reduce anxiety. Uh, this has a lot of very positive benefits. So learning how to kind of guide your clients through like visualization can be a really effective tool. Um, so, uh, we're gonna go ahead and talk about an intro to, to imagery here. Um, this is where, uh, Nassim's gonna kind of walk, uh, walk us through like sort of, uh, what imagery is as like a concept and how it can be used. So this is another intro on top of, you know, the intro that I just gave. <laughs> I usually skip these, but this one's actually a good imagery, one. Imagery, often called visualization, is a tool used to help performance and healing in diverse areas such as business surgery, coping with cancer, military operations, and psychotherapy. Imagery can be used to improve exercise technique, motivation, and self-esteem. Here, you'll learn how to use it appropriately with clients in order to maximize goal efforts. Have you ever known anyone who avoids going to the gym or working out because they have imagined themselves looking silly or out of place? They are using imagery, but in a negative, destructive way. You can use imagery techniques with clients to help change negative and self-destructive imagery into positive imagery that provides self-esteem and motivates them to engage in physical activity. For example, should the client imagine from an internal first person or external third person perspective? If a baseball player is trying to imagine swinging a bat from an internal perspective, his image will be of looking at the pitcher. If he's trying to imagine himself swinging the bat from an external perspective, he'll be able to see himself from the perspective of another, such as the pitcher or a fan in the stand. Is imagery a skill that can be learned or is it genetically based? Should imagery always be positive or should people also imagine failure? Can imagery help quicken healing from an athletic injury? Should imagery focus on the feelings of movement or the environment in which the imagery takes place? These are just some of the questions that will be answered. The question is not whether you should use imagery, but rather in which specific ways it should be used to provide maximum effectiveness in helping clients with their exercise and eating regimens. So uh, that's sort of, that, that's, he sums it up really well. <laughs> um, I sometimes think that these uh, these these videos are a little cheesy, but like um, that one is just such a, a solid summary of exactly what imagery is, right? Like you can use it from several different perspectives. It's been shown, like I said, to reduce things like anxieties uh, and hangups that somebody might have about performing like a specific activity, and it has been shown to also like improve people's ability um, to perform specific tasks. So. Um, I've got a really fun uh, example of that coming up here in just a second. So imagery, um, by definition, you know, we sometimes, like I said, this is going to be called uh, visualization if you're visualizing something in your in your mind's eye, right? Uh, and so imagery is the use of all senses. And that's the thing, right? It's not just seeing something, it's also hearing it and you know, maybe even feeling it um, to create or recreate uh, an experience in your mind. So we consider this a poly sensory um, activity or a polysensory skill rather. Uh, and what I mean by that is like poly again coming from the word many and sensory being that you should use all your senses. Um, we want our imagery to be as uh, strong as possible, as powerful as possible. And that comes through um, you know, ensuring that like when you are imagining something, you're not just seeing it, you're seeing it happen at the same rate that it would normally happen rather than kind of playing it through fast forward. That's something that I actually really struggle with. Um, 
it is like smelling exactly the same smells, maybe feeling the same emotions that you were feeling at the time, feeling the same like ambient temperature, right? All of those things. If you build all of those things simultaneously, you're going to have a much more powerful uh, simulation in your brain. So uh, using imagery, right? We can use it to either recreate experiences that maybe we want to go through uh, it differently. Uh, maybe we want to like reimagine something. So we can kind of go through it playing the correct action, or we can use it to straight up create experiences as well. Um, and so like maybe we are sort of creating something from scratch in order to shine a light on it and make it seem less intimidating. Uh, it can also be used to recreate your emotions or any thoughts that you might have been experiencing at the time, um, which is great because like that can, means that you can start to like maybe cope with any negative emotional responses that you might have had at the time. Uh, and that has been shown to increase your self-confidence, um, which is great. You can also increase your self-confidence um, through feelings of like competency. So simply like seeing yourself in your brain, uh, completing a task over and over again will give you the confidence to try to complete that task in real life. This is one of the things that I like to do with my clients. Um, this is not, you know, exactly leading them through like a major imagery technique or anything like that. But I always encourage my clients to imagine themselves uh, in the future, like imagine their future self looking back on this moment right now. Um, your future self is going to thank you for the hard work that you are putting in right now. And future self is going to have a lot easier time doing this, you know. Um, then I usually start cracking jokes about future self, which is always like kind of disarming to my clients. Um, and they enjoy it, but they also like take it very seriously where they're like, you know what, you're right. Like, um, I can see myself doing this in the future and I can see, you know, what I'm going to look like or how I'm going to perform, you know, uh, how I'm going to feel, right? All those things. And like, it's motivating, it's exciting, you know? Um, so uh, it can be used, like I said, to enhance like your self-confidence um, by creating feelings of competency because you are seeing yourself perform like specific skills um, successfully. Uh, there is also... Um, uh, a lot of really fun information out there. Uh, there's a lot of, when it comes to like talking about like imagery's effectiveness, uh, there's a lot of like anecdotal evidence out there. Like actually we can even find some right now. Um, Andres, Kenny, Dalen, have you guys ever used like imagery to success? Like have you ever, can you think of any time that you like imagined something and then were very successful at it? I mean, Use imagery. I mean, maybe another person. Like you see somebody else doing something and you see it, it works. So yeah. maybe they. That's actually, that actually is an example of imagery. If you're watching someone else, uh, like do you watch like motivational videos? Yeah, I'm just saying, even a person in front of you, like you see somebody that, you know, that's trying to get promoted or something like that, and you see some of the things they're doing, you're like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to use that. It seems to work. Yeah, absolutely. Even that is actually, that is an example of imagery. Uh, now you just, if you, you can make it even more powerful by sort of like, you know, recreating that experience, like seeing yourself doing those actions. Um, but there are, there's some really, you know, I think there's a lot of fun stories about people who are like, oh, I imagine myself doing this every single day. And then sure enough, like it started to happen. Right. Um, and this is, you know, this is where, and I'm not going to uh, weigh in too heavily on this, but when you hear about people who um, believe in like the power of manifestation and things like that, you know, they believe that like uh, by speaking certain things over and over and over again, maybe having like a mantra, um, speaking like these things, they start to sort of call it into existence and they're sort of like creating uh, little ripples in the world and then the world is sort of reflecting the, re the reality is being reflected in um, sort of their thoughts, actions, and uh, premeditations, right? Like their their constant pre preoccupations, a better way to say it, right? Um, so I, you know, I don't know, I don't know. I I'm a, I tend to be kind of a an over rationalizer, an over analyzer. I have a hard time with a lot of that uh, sort of the mystical side of that, right? Where you hear people talk about the power of positive thinking. If you've ever heard of like the Secret, for instance. Um, I have a hard time with that personally. Kenny, you got a uh, comment? Yeah, I think you're trying to say the law of attraction, right? Or yeah, law of attraction, right? So 
I, I, I'm not going to weigh in on that. I'm no expert on the law of attraction, but I will say this, something that I have seen, something that I firmly believe in is that if you continue to say certain things, uh, and those things are things that you want, if you continue to say like, I'm confident, I'm successful. Like if you say those things very frequently, I firmly believe that like that will eventually become your reality because you're going to change little tiny things in your life without realizing. And I think like one of the biggest things that we as like people have to overcome is the idea of like how much effort it really takes to do certain things, you know, um, kind of going back to previous lessons that I've talked about, like willpower is not enough. We just don't have an unlimited source of willpower. So if you're completely relying on your willpower for your success, I think that that is creating a structure for failure. I think that that is like, you know, you are designing things in an ineffective manner. You know, you're, you're putting together a bridge and you're missing one of your pillars you know, uh, to hold the freaking thing up. Um, so, but I think that if you speak positively consistently, um, what will happen is you are going to create small changes in your own life, maybe without realizing it. And since those things, since you're not even realizing it, it's not exactly taking very much effort. So it's not depleting your willpower. And you start to be a more effective, uh, healthy, happier person, you know? And that's, I think like, I think there's actually a very uh, explainable, I think that's a very explainable, measurable approach to this idea of like, you know, the law of attraction or the secret or, or manifesting or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I do believe that like uh, people who practice this are happier and successful and, and healthy. Um and there are a lot of anecdotal reports. There's a lot of experiences where people have like said things consistently. And sure enough, those things came to reality. Uh, and aside from that anecdotal side of it, right, which is the sort of hard to, to measure version of this, right? There are also case studies that have actually done this in particular. And this is where you start to look at things like placebo effects, or when you start to look at things, um, you know, fascinating experiments that we've done in human psychology, you know, placebos are amazing, by the way, like they're one of the most cool things. If you can study, like, if you want to hear some fun stories, just go on Yubo, Yubo, what? <laughs> Does anybody smell burnt toast or copper? <laughs> I just had a stroke. Uh, go to YouTube, uh, which is how that's pronounced, uh, and just Google um, uh, uh, interesting case studies about like placebo effects. It's pretty amazing. There's some really cool stories out there. Um, and so like, even just like where they've looked at case studies where researchers have sort of observed people and given them specific tasks to accomplish where it's like, we want you to say this every single day, bah, 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 right? And they've done that and they've practiced it. Um, they have seen that like, uh, those people have, have actually improved like their lives through like experimentation. And then there are actual like studies that have done like control versus test groups, um, where they've maybe had two groups of people who both have like some type of injury and the one group is in charge of like imagining themselves coming back from that uh injury more quickly and the imagining themselves led to them coming back from that injury more quickly um faster than the control group so it's pretty amazing um and you know the power of our brains is is pretty freaking cool so like i said it can be used to enhance your self-confidence. It can be used to enhance your motivation. Like again, willpower, not enough, uh, which can help, you know, when you, en you enhance your motivation by being like, you know, generally what sort of holds us back from things is sort of that first failure, right? The first time it gets hard is often where a lot of people sort of fall off the wagon. So using imagery to imagine yourself like coming up to this like hard event that's holding you back, then you start to go, okay, like I knew this was going to happen. I knew I was going to hit my plateau. And my trainer told me, you know, uh, to focus on several other different numbers and trust the process and, you know, take it in, absorb it, but then let it pass, right? So they knew that this was going to happen and they've created this moment in their brain. So when the moment actually came, they're able to go, okay, I know what to do here. Um, trust the process and just relax, right? So I don't flood my body with stress and, and make the whole situation worse, right? So then like all of a sudden they use it to overcome it. Or maybe they start to come to like, and they're like, all right, this, I knew this was going to happen. This is hard. I can try X, Y, and Z. You know, I've sort of created three options in my brain. I can go, go through them. It can help control your emotional response. Um, I'm sure you guys have done this. I, I don't know about you guys. Do you guys, uh, 
this is very much a me thing. And I, I know other people do this as well, but like, I feel like I'm the king of it. Uh, do you guys ever win arguments in the shower? <laughs> like, you know, I'll be like showering like the next day and I'll be like, my brain will be running and I'll be like, oh, I should have said this. And then if they say this, I will say this. And then if they say this, I'm going to say that. <laughs> and I'll like go through a whole argument in my head. Uh, like, you know, before, like if I know I'm going to like confront somebody about something or if I'm going to have a conversation with someone that's tough, uh, I will often like imagine that scenario uh, a few times. And it seems to always happen in, in like the shower. It's where I have like my greatest ideas uh, and it's where I often like win most of my arguments. <laughs> um, so that's kind of funny. That's that's like that can help control your emotional response because if you've already sort of gone through this process with this other person, if you're going to have maybe a hard conversation with them, um, you know, you have already sort of controlled that emotionally, and you're less likely to maybe fly off the handle or say something you don't mean, right? Um, and then it has also been shown to improve concentration, which is really cool. It can actually give you something to focus on and like stay, um, because oftentimes this is similar to meditation. A lot of times, like you are, you know thinking through like this process. So I want to show you a fun video here. I friggin' love this video. Um, this is an ASAP science video all about some very, very interesting uh, scientific studies that happened around uh, using imagery. So just using imagination uh, and how they were able to get people to improve in specific skills. So this is cool. For years, scientists believed that the brain was static, unchanging, and locked, but our understanding has changed drastically to the point where we now see the brain as plastic and constantly changing. But what if I told you that simply thinking could affect not only the way your brain works, but its physical shape and structure as well? It turns out, this is exactly what happens. From a neuroscientific standpoint, imagining an action and doing it require the same motor and sensory programs in the brain. For example, if you were to close your eyes and imagine the letter B, the primary visual cortex lights up in the same way it does when you look at the letter on the screen. Take a moment and imagine yourself writing out your signature with your dominant hand. Chances are, the amount of time it takes you to simply imagine doing it is similar to how long it actually takes to write it out. Try doing the same thing with your non-dominant hand and it actually takes you longer to write and imagine. How is this relevant? Well, because imagination and action are actually integrated and engage the same neural pathways, practicing one actually influences the other. One fascinating study took two groups and had them practice piano for two hours a day, except one group was only allowed to use mental practice. They couldn't touch the piano, but would sit in front of it and imagine practicing. The surprising result? The exact same physical changes took place in the motor cortex of both groups. And after three days, their accuracy in playing was the exact same. Beyond five days, the physical practice group did begin to excel faster, but the imagination group, when given the chance to practice physically, was able to catch up to their skill level quickly. Perhaps more incredible is an experiment which used imagination in an effort to strengthen muscles. Both groups did the same bigger muscle exercises for four weeks, though one group simply did it mentally. Those who actually did the physical exercise increased their strength by 30%, while those who imagined doing it increased their muscle strength by 22%. This is because the neurons responsible for the movement instruction were still being used and strengthened, resulting in increased strength when the muscles actually contracted. So while your thoughts don't have some mystical or magical power, mental practice is an effective way to prepare for a physical skill. Each thought actually changes the structure and function of your brain by affecting the neurons at the microscopic level. Though as much as we wish you could sit there and become the next Mozart, it won't happen without a lot of hard physical work but a little imagination never hurts. So, uh, friggin' love that, right? Like, they have literally um, measured people's brains, like, physically, right? This is a tangible thing. And had these people, like, imagine themselves practicing a specific skill, and then they got better at that specific skill, including actual physical strength. And this kind of goes back to what we know about physiology, right? Um, go back to our PFT 105 class. We talked about exercise physiology, right? Strength is determined by what, guys? Ed, this is a like hard pop quiz. It's kind of a hard question, um, but let's see if we can we can pull this out of way, right? Where what's what is strength determined by? What gives us strength? Come on, crickets. The brain, no. All right, there we go. Yeah, absolutely. I'll take it. That's great. 
Um, it is determined, you know, we get like our maximal force production, right? We get it from motor unit recruitment, motor unit firing rate, and motor unit firing frequency or rate coding, right? Um, so like that, right, those three things, like how quickly your neurons are continually firing, because remember the signal is like, pop, 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 right, we have a weak signal, which is like, pop, 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 and we have strong signals, like, ta, 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 right, those are, are the differences there. Um, so if you are creating action potentials super, 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 super rapidly, it's going to be a powerful contraction. So rate coding is one. Then we also have motor unit uh, um, synchronization, right? So motor unit synchronization coming together. This neuron firing at the same time as that neuron, right? I always like to think of it as like uh, kind of like a tug of war. You know, if you've got one neuron that's like zapping a muscle fiber and that muscle fiber is pulling, um, if it's pulling at the same time as the one behind it, you're going to get a really strong contraction. But if one of them's resetting its grip while the other one's pulling as hard as it can, they kind of cancel each other out. Um, I mean, they don't cancel each other out. They just aren't working together. So it's motor unit synchronization is also part of our strength, right? And then uh, motor unit recruitment. The more neurons you have firing to recruit more muscle fibers, the more powerful a contraction. So these are all controlled by your nervous system, right? Now, obviously, Obviously, if you create more muscle fibers and you have more muscle mass, right, you have more actin and myosin proteins, of course, that's also going to create strength. But like, we're not looking at, you know, all the ways to create strength. We're just looking at how can we use imagery? You know, how does our nervous system improve strength? So I'm not saying it's the only thing that makes you stronger, but we definitely know that like improving your ability to like imagine scenarios and just practice scenarios in your head can lead to greater strength levels which is amazing because that's a we think of that as like a physical thing we think of our thoughts as like unphysical things right um so i'm gonna pull this up and we're not gonna we're not gonna watch it in class um because it's number one it's a very long uh I mean, it's like 10 minutes, but um, if you guys want to watch a really fun video that actually does an absolutely amazing job um, of explaining how our nervous system works, um, check this out. Uh, uh, how to kill a Deadpool. <laughs> um, how to kill Deadpool uh, film theory. So there's this really fun channel called Film Theory. And film theory, yeah, it's 15 minutes long. So film film theory is, uh, what they do is they take, they will find like the smallest pieces of evidence uh, from like a movie and they'll they'll explain like why a certain concept is happening. So if anybody knows anything about like the this character, right? He basically regenerates really quickly and heals very quickly. Um, and so he's gonna break down, this guy's like incredibly smart. And he's going to break down exactly how, like, you could actually kill him, you know? Um, because basically he's like, you know, what they prove in the movies is that he's basically unkillable. Um, and so he talks, it's it's very funny. If you get a chance, it's a really fun video. Um, look it up. It's a blast. Uh, and check out these guys. Other videos. They're super fun. Like, he's just a really, like, he just gives a scientific breakdown for everything. Um, and it started with game theory. He talks about like uh, specific like video games and, and how those uh, created things. Um, but basically, uh, you know, he talks about in the video how our thoughts are physical things, right? So our thoughts are, you know, we often think of our thoughts as sort of these intangible, you know, uh, psychological things that really, you know, there's like, oh, it's just your thoughts. It's not like you can't like hold like a thought. But the thing is, you kind of can actually. Like what a thought or an action is, is a sequence uh, in like some specific neurons, right? So if we look, let's see, I'm gonna, uh, neurons, and actually that might be enough, right? Let's just Google neurons. Uh, that'll work. I was kind of hoping for a crappier drawing. Actually, I was looking for a simpler one. Uh, that works. All right. So you literally have billions of neurons, right? Literally billions, right? Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and copy this image here. Uh, and we're just going to go to paint. And we're going to paste it here. I'm going to zoom out like crazy. So, all right. So there's a neuron, there's a neuron, there's a neuron, there's a neuron. There's, a, there's a lot of them in this picture, but there's billions inside of your body, right? Billions and millions and millions. So if you were to travel, we're just going to kind of uh, simulate like a path here, right? If you were to travel from this neuron down over to this one. And then you were to travel over to this one, and then maybe over here, and then maybe down here, 
right? That path is maybe you thinking about the time uh, that you like picked up your puppy, right? So that's that thought. But let's say we just change that path ever so slightly, right? So now we're gonna travel from the same beginning neuron, but this time we're gonna travel over here, over here, over here, but then we're just gonna go over here. And maybe that's the time uh, that you are thinking about like getting a pay raise at work. <laughs> uh, and then let's say we travel from here, up to here, over to here, down to here, and then this way. That's maybe you tasting something uh, really sweet. Uh, you know, like maybe you just ate a piece of candy. So look at how many times we recycled neurons. We went down the same paths, you know, temporarily, but the overall sequence was slightly different. That's what your thoughts are. Um, and so we have a million, this is also why we are so bad at remembering things accurately, because uh, this is, you know, not exactly a perfect system. <laughs> uh, human memory is incredibly flawed, but that is a totally different conversation. Uh, <laughs> but um, that is sort of, you know, what that's what your thoughts, that's what your actions are. So recruiting a bicep muscle uh, in one way versus a slightly different way, right? Maybe the angle's like this versus the angle like this, right? That's a very minor difference, but it requires like a totally different sequence of neurons firing to recruit those muscles, right? And so imagery has been shown to activate the same parts of the brain that actually recruit those muscles. So if you are trying to develop your, let's say, self-confidence, right, uh, you can create feelings of competency because you are going to see yourself doing this action. And the neurons that have performed that action, they may not actually be doing it physically in real life, but they are creating it in their brain. And so those neurons are actually firing. And they've looked at people, they've put them into an MRI and said, I want you to imagine yourself uh, swinging a baseball bat. And then they've hooked them up, you know, they've, they've had them actually swing a baseball bat and they see the same parts of their brain light up. They see the same neurons firing in the exact same way. Um, so we know that this can improve uh, your confidence in sports, in exercise, just in your life in general. Um, and so I've got another really fun video that is going to kind of talk about this. This one's a little bit longer, uh, but this is also about like how we can use practice uh, in a really fun, very effective way. Mastering any physical skill, be it performing a pirouette, playing an instrument, or throwing a baseball, takes practice. Practice is the repetition of an action with the goal of improvement, and it helps us perform with more ease, speed, and confidence. So what does practice do in our brains to make us better at things? Our brains have two kinds of neural tissue, gray matter and white matter. The gray matter processes information in the brain, directing signals and sensory stimuli to nerve cells, while white matter is mostly made up of fatty tissue and nerve fibers. In order for our bodies to move, information needs to travel from the brain's gray matter down the spinal cord through a chain of nerve fibers called axons to our muscles. So how does practice or repetition affect the inner workings of our brains? The axons that exist in the white matter are wrapped with a fatty substance called myelin, and it's this myelin covering or sheath that seems to change with practice. Myelin is similar to insulation on electrical cables. It prevents energy loss from electrical signals that the brain uses, moving them more efficiently along neural pathways. Some recent studies in mice suggest that the repetition of a physical motion increases the layers of myelin sheath that insulates the axons. And the more layers, the greater the insulation around the axon chains, forming a sort of superhighway for information connecting your brain to your muscles. So while many athletes and performers attribute their successes to muscle memory, muscles themselves don't really have memory. Rather, it may be the myelination of neural pathways that give these athletes and performers their edge with faster and more efficient neural pathways. There are many theories that attempt to quantify the number of hours, days, and even years of practice that it takes to master a skill. 
While we don't yet have a magic number, we do know that mastery isn't simply about the amount of hours of practice. It's also the quality and effectiveness of that practice. Effective practice is consistent, intensely focused, and targets content or weaknesses that lie at the edge of one's current abilities. So if effective practice is the key, how can we get the most out of our practice time? Try these tips. Focus on the task at hand. Minimize potential distractions by turning off the computer or TV and putting your cell phone on airplane mode. In one study, researchers observed 260 students studying. On average, those students were able to stay on task for only six minutes at a time. Laptops, smartphones, and particularly Facebook were the root of most distractions. Start out slowly or in slow motion. Coordination is built with repetitions, whether correct or incorrect. If you gradually increase the speed of the quality repetitions, you have a better chance of doing them correctly. Next, frequent repetitions with allotted breaks are common practice habits of elite performers. Studies have shown that many top athletes, musicians, and dancers spend 50 to 60 hours per week on activities related to their craft. Many divide their time used for effective practice into multiple daily practice sessions of limited duration. And finally, practice in your brain in vivid detail. It's a bit surprising, but a number of studies suggest that once a physical motion has been established, it can be reinforced just by imagining it. In one study, 144 basketball players were divided into two groups. Group A physically practiced one-handed free throws, while Group B only mentally practiced them. When they were tested at the end of the two-week experiment, the intermediate and experienced players in both groups had improved by nearly the same amount. As scientists get closer to unraveling the secrets of our brains, our understanding of effective practice will only improve. In the meantime, effective practice is the best way we have of pushing our individual limits achieving new heights and maximizing our potential. So <clears throat> love that video. <laughs> Some of it's very cool where it's talking about like how uh, you can literally practice things uh, in your brain and it will create like specific changes in the real world, right? Um, so like I said, this can also improve your motivation. Uh, which is also awesome, right? We can use imagery uh, to develop like new learning strategies. So if you are, you know, worried about, uh, you know, the effectiveness of something, you can imagine it in your brain and then be like, all right, yeah, I'm going to run into this problem around here. And how do I get around that problem? And you're going to imagine like kind of, you know, your solutions, right? What happens when you hit your flat first plateau? Ah, that's what I need to get back online, you know, and find like a new workout routine, right? Um, so, uh, it can also, like I said, help you control your emotional responses. So, uh, it can create higher levels of, and it says arousal here, which always makes people laugh. Uh, we mean like, you know, uh, stimulation in the brain, <laughs> um, but it can also, uh, influence your anxiety levels, influence your emotions and have a very positive effect. Uh, on, like I said, like exercises, emotions, right? Like if you have a client who maybe doesn't enjoy, you know, uh, exercise as much as, as you know, you, we would like them to, right? They're just like, look, I'm here because my doctor told me to get healthy. I, I hate this, you know, <laughs> um, helping them, uh, you know, uh, creating like a pre- occupation with that activity and like imagining themselves doing the things that they like to do or being like hey i know you're not a big fan of this right now but like imagine how you're going to feel when this is like much easier right that can help them like sort of control their emotions because then they're going to be focused on the positive stuff that's coming down the pipe they're going to be excited rather than living in the moment of like yeah this these burpees suck you know <laughs> um and then like i said it can be used to improve concentration like we saw uh, in the video, right? He was talking about like how Facebook or, or really like just any distractions that we have out there, they pull us away, right? Um, I mean, you guys are listening to me on a phone or a tablet or a computer right now. And uh, I mean, you gotta occasionally have like another window open, I'm assuming, you know, <laughs> you gotta have music playing in the background maybe, or, you know, maybe your TV's on somewhere else. Like, I'm sure I've, I'm not able to hold your attention for the entire, you know, two and a half, two hours that we, we meet in these lectures. Uh, and that's okay. 
that's a reality, right? Um, but if you, we know that that's true, like imagining ourselves like, you know, using imagery to sort of improve our concentration can help draw our focus back to maybe something that is important to us, right? Um, so like, uh, you know, um, learning how to like cope with any like errors that we haven't had where it's like, I did get distracted, but it's okay. Like I can always get back, right? Having like a strategy for getting back to concentration. Um, and then like simply like drawing attention to your awareness. It's like, oh, I wasn't aware of like how many times I got distracted. Um, when, uh, I remember when uh, quarantine first broke out um, and they were all, everybody was talking about like washing your hands all the time, right? It was like, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. And uh, there were all these like really fun videos and out there about like hand washing and another really fun video that I really liked. Remember the guy I showed you the video about like the pee in pools? Um, that guy did another video about the effectiveness of hand washing. And what he did was he took like this UV powder that you can't really see uh, under like a normal light, but you can see it under a black light. And he took, uh, he went to a kindergarten class um, and, uh, you know, the kindergarten teacher taught all the kids how to wash their hands very, very effectively. And what he did is he put a little bit of that powder on like, uh, I think three kids' hands and then let them, you know, move around the room and like live their day. Um, and they were told to wash their hands and like they did and did this and that. And uh, you could see where they had very clearly missed parts of their hands while they were washing them. Uh, and then he took a black light around the entire room and it was just covered in this stuff. And then the te the poor teacher, like this is why you're, you should, everyone should thank preschool teachers. Uh, they are infected with more germs than anybody on this freaking planet. <laughs> and she was just covered head to toe, you know, from all these like kids' hands and stuff. And that kid, you know, touched that kid and then that kid touched this and that, you know. Um, it was really a fascinating video. And then he was like, uh, he filmed himself for like, I think two hours while he was working on a video. Uh, and, you know, he talked about like uh, how a lot of people like touch their face and he's like, ah, there's no way I touch my face. And then sure enough, like, you know, he had put the stuff on his hands um, and there it was like, he, you know, watched back the video and he UV light and it was all over his whole freaking body. And he didn't realize like how many times he was passively like touching himself and various different parts and places and ways that he was like going about like you know just little like scratches here and little things like that uh and you don't realize it right you're totally unaware of these things um now i'm kind of sidetracked a little bit because i'm just like summarizing this fun video that i watched uh but that just kind of goes to show you like uh if you think that you are like, you know, uh, not distracted and you think that you're like, nah, I don't glance at Instagram that much or I don't like, you know, browse memes that often, right? Uh, I think you'd be shocked at how many minutes per day you actually like do in these scenarios. Um, so imagery can help like improve with that concentration. So, all right, so we've kind of, we kind of set the stage pretty clearly. Um, let's talk about like how imagery actually works, right? Let's, let's talk about like, you know, what's going on on like a, a neuromuscular or, or nervous system level. Um, here's a fun one. The brain is a powerful tool that scientists are still trying to learn the intricacies of. One of the areas they're still learning about is how imagery in the mind impacts the body. People can generate information from memory that was essentially the same as what was received during the actual experience. Consequently, imagining events can have an effect on the nervous system similar to that of the actual or real experience. Many theoretical explanations have been developed to help explain the influence of imagery on performance and a host of other thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Psychoneuromuscular theory suggests that imagery facilitates the learning of motor skills due to neuromuscular activity patterns activated during the imagining process. Vividly imagined events innervate muscles in somewhat the same way that physically practicing movements does. These slight neuromuscular impulses are hypothesized to be identical to those produced during actual performance but in a reduced magnitude. Symbolic learning theory is a cognitively oriented theory, suggesting that imagery may function as a coding system to help people understand and acquire movement patterns. This means that the more individuals imagine a particular movement pattern, the more that mental blueprint will be reinforced in their memory. 
when an individual creates a motor program in the brain, a mental blueprint is formed for successfully completing the movement. Probably the best developed theoretical explanation for the effects of imagery is the bioinformational theory. This is based on the assumptions that an image is a functionally organized set of propositions stored in the brain. These propositions are really just coded information of a stimulus and the response that is typically associated with that stimulus. So when a person imagines an event in as much detail as possible, the coded information will result in a physiologically appropriate response. For example, if an individual imagines everything involved in maximally performing a bench press, he will physically start to experience those associated responses, such as increased heart rate and blood flow. So that's kind of fun, right? Like imagine, like if you were to think of yourself like going on like a full maximum effort sprint right now, your body would actually start to go into sort of fight or flight response. It would start shutting down blood flow to certain parts of your digestive system. Uh, so they can open up blood flow to your cardiorespiratory and like muscular systems to perform this activity because your brain kind of doesn't know the difference between thinking about something and actually doing it. So these are sort of the three uh, theories that we think are, are associated with like how imagery works. The first one, psychoneuromuscular theory, right? And basically this says that imagery facilitates learning of motor skills due to the nature of how the brain activates during specific neuromuscular patterns. So earlier when I was talking about neurons traveling from A to B to C versus A to C back to B, you know, in a different route, um, that's sort of related to psychoneuromuscular theory. So the brain fires in very similar ways when you are imagining something as it does when you're actually performing the activity. Um, so that's kind of fun. And they've looked, like I said, they've done EMG analysis. Uh, and they re recorded like the electrical activity of like our muscles. And they have seen they are very similar to when we are just thinking about doing something versus when we are actually doing something. Uh, there is also symbolic learning theory. Uh, this is the idea that imagery helps the brain coordinate your thoughts, your actions, and your emotions uh, by creating like a coded system. So basically, oh, hold on. Uh, Gotcha. So basically, uh, when I say uh, something is like, like when I say like a coded system, right, uh, it means that like your brain is starting to draw uh, like an idea where it's like, okay, when this is happening, then I'm doing this, right? Uh, when I'm doing this, I'm doing this, right? And so it creates sort of like a coded system to like, you know, directly draw like associations between uh, your thoughts and your actions, right? And then bioinformational theory is basically, this one is, is a little bit more uh, about like how your brain is basically just like, it's just a set of propositions. So it's a lot of like, if then statements, right? Uh, like if you get like, uh, if then flow chart. Um, yeah, that'll work. So this is kind of like, basically, oh, I love this. It's a morning routine flow chart. This is great because we're talking about habits. <laughs> So this is sort of a flow chart of like your morning routine, right? You're going to start, uh, get out of bed, and then your brain is going to ask you a proposition, right? It's going to say, do I need to use the bathroom? If yes, then go to the bathroom, right? If no, then go straight to eat breakfast, right? Then your brain's going to say, is it is today like the weekend? Uh, it, or I'm sorry, is today the weekday? If no, then put on your street clothes. If yes, then put on your work clothes, right? Uh, and then once you go have fun versus go to work, right? And then there's the end of your day, right? Love, I love this. this is the perfect example of what I was looking for. Um, that's a flow chart, right? So your brain sort of like the theory behind like bioinformational theory, the idea behind it is that your brain is having like a flow chart to deal with these scenarios. And the more, you know, you get used to these scenarios, uh, the better, right? Um, so like, this is one of the reasons why, like, I tend to really like, like checklists when I'm doing specific tasks, cause then I can like, you know, do them very systematically. Right. Um, so uh, an image is a set of like propositions where you're like, okay, if this happens, then I'll do this. If this happens, then I'll do that, right? Um, so we have a couple different versions of these, by the way, these, these propositions, these like if then statements. Uh, there's stimulus propositions, which are uh, describing specific uh, features of the scene, right? To be imagined. So like stimulus propositions are like, hey, when you're imagining stuff, you know, imagine yourself in a very sim similar scenario. You know, sometimes like, Sometimes our imagination can be very undetailed. Sometimes it can be like, 
uh, you know, just like a blank slate, like it's like you kind of moving through like a black background, right? Um, versus like response propositions, which are imagining specific physiologic or emotional responses, right? So like a stimulus proposition might be like, all right, if it looks like this, then we're going to do this. If it feels like this, we're going to do this, right? Versus response propositions where like, okay, if I, you know, psychologically feel this way, then I know that I, then I need to recognize that and, you know, do X, Y, and Z, right? Um, some people when they, you know, uh, for instance, if they, start feeling anxious, right? Then they need to, you know, the minute they start to notice themselves feeling anxious, they need to take a big deep breath and relax, right? Um, so uh, that is sort of, those are sort of the three main ways that we think imagery actually sort of works and why, why it's sort of acting, activating these parts of our brains. Now, like I said, we can use imagery um, in the realm of like exercise, right? So exercise technique, right? Helping our clients like perform specific skills using like an exercise piece of equipment or something um, can be very, very, very effective for getting us to get better at those skills. So like, uh, you know, oftentimes like when I'm telling someone how to do something, right? We're coaching them, right? Go back to like our general coaching process, right? We go through it. It's like we have them perform the movement. We describe anything that they did incorrectly, right? So now like this is an opportunity to sort of, you know, add some imagery into the coaching process. We're like, hey, so, you know, we're seeing a lot of arching of the low back and we're kind of dropping our chest up towards the sky which means that your body's trying to use your chest rather than use your shoulders for, you know, this, this shoulder press that we're performing. So um, what you're doing is a little bit more of this rather than this. So we're going to describe and show model like the, the, uh, what was happening. Right. And so it's like, now I want you to like, you know, imagine me like sitting very upright, going straight up overhead, you know, locking out the arms and then coming back down and imagine your hands are between like two plates of glass. You know, um, you can't tip this way, you're going to break it. You can't tip this way, you're going to break it, right? So we want to have this travel directly up and down 90 degrees to the ground, right? Uh, and, you know, that can be like, that can draw an image that allows them to go, okay, so I'm going to imagine myself. And then like, then they're going to press, you know, straight up rather than maybe pushing at an angle or arching their back or something like that, which is in, in incorrect form, right? Uh, this tends to be used a little bit more frequently by men than women, although, you know, we're the ones coaching here, so we, we want to kind of just encourage any of our clients um, to do all of this. Um, uh, but things you need to remember, like when it comes to, uh, you know, your appearance, right? Um, this can be an, an important, like, uh, uh, motivational factor as well, right? In the realm of, like, exercise, we can say, hey, I want you to imagine what you're going to look like in six months, right? Uh, I want you to imagine uh, how you're going to feel in six months, I want you to imagine how you're going to perform in six months, right? And that can improve your motivation. It can improve, like you know, creating these strong images, uh, and that can also, you know, alleviate the uh, the anxiety there. Um, now, when all that starts to happen, right, that's going to make our client more secure. They're going to feel more confident, and what comes along with confidence efficacy, right? Remember, self-efficacy is an individual's belief that they can accomplish a specific task, right? Are you effective? Are you efficient at performing a specific task? If you believe that you are, you have high levels of self-efficacy, right? Um, and so this is going to give our give you like more confidence. And we know that people who have more confidence perform better than people who are very nervous, you know? Uh, my favorite example of this is a story that my dad used to tell about my uncle, my uncle Jim, my dad and my uncle Jim are both incredible pool players. Um, my dad, I, he and I used to do like pool tournaments all the time when I was a little kid and, um, he was amazing. Uh, and he would like, and, you know, and it's because he would like hustle people in his youth. Like he would totally get into like, you know, dangerous situations because he was like hustling people for money like a dummy <laughs> but uh you know my and my uncle jim was even better than him um and apparently my aunt thelma as well um so they all used to play and they were incredible and my uncle jim was so good that he got drafted onto this like professional pool playing team he was i guess we could technically say he was a pro athlete although i'm not going to call <laughs> <laughs> a pool play. I don't know. Uh, that's me being judgmental. Uh, <laughs> so he uh, he was not as good as like most of the other people on that team. But what my uncle Jim was incredible at is he had steel nerves. You know, he had he had nerves of steel that he just you know no matter how big a game was, 
he would be the guy that they would send in because like he wouldn't get nervous and it wouldn't affect his play at all. Uh, and one time he, um, he was in this tournament and this, he was, you know, they, it was like the final like game or whatever. Uh, and they had to choose like who on the team was going to go up for this like final round. Uh, and they put him in and he got to rat, he got to, to break it. Um, I don't know why, but he was the one breaking. And, uh, here's the thing. My uncle Jim and my dad taught me. So if you get the eight ball in, um, on the first shot, it's the only time you don't have to call the eight ball. Like normally you have to call like where the eight ball is going to go. Right. Otherwise you lose the game. Uh, but if you get it in like the break, it's just an instant win. And there's a way to make the eight ball go into the opposite side pocket if you shoot it from a specific spot. But it's very risky because you'll often scratch in the corner pocket, which will make you lose the game instantly. Um, so Mongo Jim like eyeballs this break and sure enough, he goes up there and he goes wham! And he just like puts the eight ball in the side pocket and wins it in one shot. And everyone's like blown away. And he goes up to the guy afterwards and he's like, sorry, man. He's like, you're just much better at this than I am. And I just knew this is the only way to beat you, <laughs> which is the cockiest thing in the world to say to someone. Um, but that's like, uh, uh, yeah, my dad used to tell that story all the time uh, when I was like growing up and we were playing pool and stuff. Um, but the thing is, the reason he was like so confident, right, is because he could very easily like imagine himself performing like a specific activity. He had very high levels of self-efficacy. And so because he believed in his own abilities enough, he had no reason to be nervous, right? And so then like that's sort of where this confidence comes from, right? Um, so I'm sure you guys have lots of things that you are incredibly confident at that you don't even think about anymore in terms of like, you know, thinking about like, oh, I might not be able to perform this activity. Our clients often like, especially in the realm of exercise, right? Like Dalen, I'm sure you're really confident about like how to do, um, you know, push-ups and pull-ups and then like, Kenny, it sounds like you're getting really confident with the deadlift. Andres, like we, we, everybody in here, we all have like our things that we're very, very confident in. Our clients don't have that. And so oftentimes they'll have very low self-efficacy self and they may not be able to perform an activity because they believe that they're not going to be able to perform that activity. So we can use imagery to help them, right? Uh, overcome any of those barriers, finish difficult tasks, uh, make a plan and, and believe in their own success, right? We can have them effectively uh, learn how to you know, practice, right? And that's gonna kind of help them control their feelings it's going to control their emotions, right? Reduce their stress, boost their energy. And it can even help overcome, like if you have like, even just like the aches and pains associated with discomforts and things, uh, it can even overcome that. Um, so uh, some amazing stuff about imagery here. So, all right. So now we got to kind of understand like what the components are. You know, if we were going to lead our clients through like an imagery exercise, um, we need to understand like how, to create specific pieces of that imagery. So here's one more video um, on uh, another acronym, because <laughs> that's all psychology is, just nothing but acronyms. Um, we're gonna look at what's called PETLEP. Okay, so PETLEP is uh, um, basically the components of effective imagery, right? These are all the things that you need to consider, right? If you're building a house, you would have a floor and walls and a ceiling, right? Uh, these are all the pieces of, of what you need to put together to build an effective imagined activity. So here we go. Uh, here we go. <laughs> when using imagery techniques, they should be functionally equivalent to the actual skill or behavior that is performed in real life. To accomplish this, functional equivalence, Holmes and Collins suggest a seven-part model based on current scientific findings. For the practitioner, imagery scripts should incorporate physical, environmental, timing, task, learning, emotional, and perspective elements, hence the acronym PETLEP. Though this model was developed for sports performance, it has shown great usefulness for exercisers as well. The seven components of the pet let model are a good starting point for developing an imagery training program because they provide direction on the most effective way to imagine the desired behavior. Physical imagery emphasizes that imagery should closely approximate the actual motor preparation and execution by having the person mimic the actual movement to be performed. Environmental imagery 
should take place in an environment that is similar, if not identical, to the actual physical environment. For example, a marathon runner should practice imagery that is identical to their next run. Task imagery should have the individual focus on what the task is and what is entailed to perform it correctly. For example, if a client is going to imagine performing a golf swing, it should include all actions that will be involved with the swing. Timing imagery should include the same amount of time to imagine the movement or skill as it takes to actually perform the movement skill. This means the task, assuming it is short enough, should be timed out so that the client can rehearse the skill mentally in the same amount of time. In learning imagery, the image should match the stage of learning of the performer. This means that if someone is a novice exerciser, they should imagine themselves just as that, including what the experience might be like to perform movements correctly. For emotional imagery, the individual should imagine the emotional state felt when actually performing the movement or skill. When an exerciser is doing cardio they enjoy, the imagery should focus on the positive emotional experiences. The perspective refers to whether the imagery is performed from an internal or external point of view. Is the client imagining watching themselves perform the task or are they imagining it from their own perspective? By implementing each component of the PET-LEP model when scripting and guiding clients through imagery, the professional will produce the most effective results for this component of behavioral influence. Ah, <laughs> so loud. All right. Um, so uh, that is, so, so pet lep is going to be all of our little like components here, right? So pet lep is really great because like you can uh, kind of get familiar with all of these individual pieces. You're going to be able to more effectively conjure up um, stronger imagery, right? So, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, the first thing you need to create uh, is going to be like the physical aspect of the image that you're creating in your mind. So the image conjured should closely approximate the actual motor preparation and the actual execution. So what we mean is like, you should physically be doing something that is exactly the same as like the task that you are imagining, right? If you want to get better at hitting a baseball, you need to imagine yourself where you're holding a bat, how you're going to twist your body, right? How you're going to create all that torque, um, what you're going to do with your legs, what you're going to do with your upper body, what you're going to do, you know, um, all of the physical approximations need to be similar, right? Like, you know, what are you wearing even, right? Like, how does the, how do the clothes like, you know, grip your body? Um, the environment needs to be very similar, right? The image should take place in an environment that is similar or at least familiar um, to the physical environment of the activity. So again, you're not practicing, you know, swinging a baseball bat in your bedroom, hopefully. <laughs> you should be doing it like on a baseball diamond, right? So imagine yourself like at home plate uh, in a batting cage, you know, like whatever, like imagine yourself in that same exact environment. Um, the task, the task should reflect the actual task that you are trying to perform. So, you know, when I say tasks, uh, what we mean is like, you want to be doing the exact same activity, uh, you know, that you would be like during game. So again, like if it's swinging a baseball bat, right? Um, are you like swinging for the fences or are you trying to get an RBI, right? Are you swinging, uh, are you going to make a bunt, right? Like, are you going to, you know, drive it into the infield, um, you know, to advance like a runner? It depends on what you're doing, right? Like it, it, your task is going to be different. So whichever one you're practicing, don't, you know, don't make it up as you go. Don't go like in there thinking you're going to slug it and then let the imagery take over and, you know, be like, oh, and I have to swing for something else, right? The task should be related to the actual task and it should also be related to your actual expertise. Um, this is where, uh, kind of similar to learning here, uh, you know, you should base it, like if you can, you know, if you're practicing layups and you can't dunk a basketball, um, you know, you should be practicing like your task should be, those things should be separate, right? Um, timing, the amount of time taken, this is one I struggle with a lot. Uh, your timing of the imagined experience should be the same uh, as the actual timing for the actual activity. So remember the first video we watched, uh, he was talking about how like you imagine yourself like writing out your signature with your dominant hand, right? Um, and you're like, okay. And then imagine yourself, uh, you know, writing that signature with your non-dominant hand 
and it actually takes longer, <laughs> right? Uh, that is the timing related to your imagery. So don't rush through your imagery. Um, don't reset your imagery over and over and over again. Um, imagine how long uh, it takes to perform that physical activity, right? And make sure that it's similar to the actual time it takes to complete that physical activity. Uh, the learning should match your stage of learning. Again, um, you know, uh, if you are just learning how to, you know, if you've never touched a basketball in your life and you're trying to learn how to like shoot it, uh, maybe don't imagine yourself doing like a triple backflip dunk, <laughs> right? Like the imagery that should be based on like where you are as, as like a learner, right? Um, I'm not going to take like a brand new client and have them imagine themselves doing like a, you know, power snatch, right? Uh, I'm going to teach them how to do like a deadlift first and then how to do like a an overhead press second, right? Teach them how to do like, uh, you know, eventually teach them how to do like an upright row and then get them into like doing like a, a hang clean and then like a full power clean and then like a clean and jerk. And then eventually we can get into like snatching, right? Um, so make sure it is based on like the learning stage. Uh, we don't want to do too much too fast. Uh, emotionally, you should conjure up a similar emotional state. Like, you know, if you're trying to recreate an experience in your mind, or if you're trying to like create a new experience in your mind, uh, are you going to be nervous? Are you going to be confident? Um, if you are going to be nervous and you want to be confident, right? Uh, imagine yourself accurately first and then go back through and practice that imagery, um, you know, with confidence, right? Like what steps can you take to change that? This is where the emotional one, like this is where often like replaying things in your head a few different times uh, can allow you to, uh, you know, have various different emotional states there and kind of practice all of them. Uh, and now the last one is sort of the most complicated and that is your perspective. So this is where when you're conjuring up imagery, you've got to determine, are you going to imagine the scenario from an internal perspective, like first person style, like imagine you doing it, right? Uh, you are seeing through your own eyes, or are you doing it from an external perspective where maybe you're seeing it as like a spectator? Um, we really like a good blend of both of these things, right? So internal imagery is imagery performed for your own point of view. Uh, you are imagining it as if you are doing it. And external is imagining from an outside perspective, you're watching yourself do like a specific activity. Both work, like I said, really, 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 really well. So oftentimes what you'll wanna do is imagine yourself going through a scenario internally and then imagine yourself going through a scenario externally. Um, doing both of those things is going to further enhance uh, and, and reinforce that imagery, right? Um, so, uh, if we're looking at how to do this, let me see here if, I, if this is coming up. Yeah, it's actually not. So uh, if we're doing this, there's actually a really good uh, sort of guided version of this in your manual. Um, let me go ahead and pull this up here. Oh. Let's zoom out a little bit. Um, where are we at? Okay, so uh, if we're doing this right, you're gonna wanna kinda go through this a few different ways. Um, yeah, so uh, this little like kinda teal section right here, um, this is gonna be, uh, this is sort of gonna help you sort of recall certain experiences and practice your imagery if you're trying to get better at this. Um, and what you'll do is you are going to uh, practice like alone first, right? Like imagine yourself in a scenario where no one's watching you. Uh, and then you are eventually going to imagine yourself in a scenario where people are watching you. And what you do is you're going to go through that task um, and imagine yourself going through that test, uh, task as accurately as possible. And then, especially with the one where people are watching you, uh, what you can do is you can then imagine yourself going through that task and making a mistake um, or making like failure, uh, but we don't want to leave it there. Then we are going to immediately go back and imagine yourself doing this task perfectly. Uh, and then as we go through that task perfectly, we want to imagine it from an internal perspective. Then we want to imagine again from an external perspective. So there are several steps through this process. Um, and if you go through this little guided section here, 
this is a really great way um, to kind of sort, of sort of practice these things. And then there's some things that you can use to also increase your vividness, right? Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So uh, once we kind of sort of go through imagery and start practicing and kind of get used to it, uh, we're going to start evaluating these skills, right? Um, so we need to go through like uh, and sort of evaluate, like, what am I doing? You know, what's what's really effective about imagery? What's working really well? What am I doing great? What am I you know, just kind of struggling with, right? Um, so we're going to assess you know, an individual's current level of their imagery skills. That's where, you know, an evaluation like this works really well, right? You're going to ask your client, um, you know, rate how well you saw yourself doing the activity. What about how, you, how well you heard yourself doing the activity? Did you just draw like a silent image of you doing this? Or could you hear like birds in the sky, right? Um, how'd you feel yourself doing the movements, right? Could you feel like, you know, uh, when your muscles torqued, like any of the, the pressure that was in your back as you were twisting, right? How well were you aware of your mood? All these different questions, you're going to rate on like a scale of like one to five and see like, what you're really good at versus like maybe what parts of the imagery you are sort of struggling with right um and then remember like uh we want to make sure that we understand like how this uh we have some realistic expectations here you know this imagery is not going to improve like overnight you know you just like anything else in terms of exercise like how do we get better at it how do we improve it you know how do we become like an exercise master right um practice and experience right like over and over and over and over again um, and part of the things that are also going to make your, your imagery much more effective, uh, effective is going to be looking at your imagery's vividness. And this is kind of what we've been talking about the entire time, but here's the sort of definition version of it, right? So vividness is uh, how much detail is in your imagery, right? So vividness exercise number one, here you can see, uh, imagine that you're home in your living room, look around and take in all the details. What do you see? Um, do you see a couch, television, chair, lamps? Like, uh, is it is it hardwood or is it a rug? Right? Um, what do you hear? What's the temperature like? How are you sitting the way you normally sit? Um, what's the shape and the texture of the furniture? Take in all of that, right? Maybe even how does it smell, right? All those things. The more of those things you can conjure up, and the more that you can kind of keep that in your image, um, the more detailed it's going to be, right? Um, that's vividness, right? It's it's how detailed your images are. But then you also want to understand there's a controllability aspect to this well as well, right? This is another thing that I tend to struggle with when I'm, you know, using imagery activities is uh, controllability, right? Sometimes like my imagination just starts going off the rails. And so I'll be like, I need to imagine myself, uh, you know, um, sprinting 400 meters. And then all of a sudden Megatron shows up and I'm like, oh God, Transformers are here. You know, <laughs> um, that shows low levels of controllability. <laughs> it's like, oh, luckily Gandalf's here to fight Megatron. Great. <laughs> you know, like, and now my brain is going off somewhere else. Uh, and I'm on an adventure flying through space. You know, <laughs> like um, that shows sort of poor controllability. So we need to kind of bring that back, you know, um, uh, how much controllability you have. To give you a more accurate assessment, a lot of times, like when I do imagery, uh, I will often, con you know, create like a really vivid image, uh, and then I'll, I'll get like halfway through like an imagery exercise, and I'll either rush through to the end, uh, or it'll just kind of keep resetting over and over again. I feel like those are the things that I tend to kind of struggle with in the imagery world, um, and so the controllability factor is something that you know gets better through practice. Um, so that's what we're seeing here, right? The, the big elements that we're going to see, we need to obviously practice. Um, uh, and that's going to help increase like how well you get at this. We also need to develop coping imagery. Coping imagery is like, hey, when we make a mistake, what are we going to do, right? Uh, how do we cope with, you know, uh, this mistake that we might make, right? Again, like if I am conjuring up an image where, you know, I'm trying to perform like a specific activity, but like I fail at that activity, right? What's my emotional, what's my physical, you know, what is my psychological response to that failure? Uh, and one of the ways you can also do this is using like recording devices, right? Um, anybody in here who has ever played football or any other sport, right? Chances are you've gone back to the tape, right? Um, this is one of the things I love to do this with my clients. I love to, and I always make them use their phones because they're the ones, you know, that way I don't have to keep it uh, and lose it. But like, um, I love to like during the overhead squat, like film my clients, like doing their squat and then break down for them. Be like, here's what we can see from these muscles. You know, here's what this is telling me. 
I want to see improvement in this like over time. Right. And then like, you know, they improve and they improve and they improve and get better. And then we take another video. And it's like, do you see how, like, look at the stark contrast here. Like you're clearly engaging your medial glute a lot more. Your knees aren't caving in the way they were, uh, you know, when we first started. Uh, and that can enhance the clarity that it can enhance the vividness when your client imagines what you're saying in their brain, when you're saying like, okay, remember, I want you to drive your knees out during the squat, activate your glutes, right? They're going to know exactly what you mean by that. They're going to know how to do that and what muscles they have to contract. That's going to improve their confidence. It's going to improve their motivation. It's going to improve everything. So drawing this all back and, and, and talking about how we can use imagery, right? It depends on what kind of, uh, where our client is at in the stages of change, right? So if we've got a client who's pre-contemplating, remember, there's a client who has no interest in changing, right? They're not thinking about it. So we, our imagery should be related. If we're going to use imagery as a, as a tool, uh, it needs to be based around the idea of getting this person to start thinking about it, right? So similar stories is a good example of this, right? Uh, you can use like anecdotes um, to uh, uh, make that person like hear a story about like how someone else's life may have improved or you know how easy it was that for them to start engaging in physical activity um tell them a story recount like a fun story about like a time you worked with someone similar to their shoes right this like i said it's very rare that you're going to get pre-contemplators um coming to the gym because again like they wouldn't have come to the gym if they're not thinking about working out right um Although it'll happen occasionally, you'll get a client who's there maybe because like their spouse asked them to or their doctor told them to and they're like, I want to listen to my doctor even if I don't care, right? Um, and so our interventions for clients and the pre-contemplators, similar stories are really helpful, you know, where it's like, oh, I had a client who's in a similar situation who, bop, 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 right? And then they start to go, oh, well, it sounds like that person's life improved, right? Um, or if you can get them to like imagine themselves in five or 10 years, that's another really effective way. Clients who are in the contemplation stage, uh, this is where uh, you can have them do their own testimonial. It's kind of a fun one, right? Um, whoa. <laughs> My chair just tried to lean back. Uh, using like, uh, say like, okay, well, you know, for your own testimony, I want you to imagine like, you know, uh, write yourself the story. What are you going to say to your friends in a year when your life has completely changed for the better, right? Um, what are you going to tell like your grandkids? What are you going to tell like your family in one year's time uh, when they ask you about like today's journey, right? Where today's journey started. Um, that's really fun, right? Like they start to see themselves doing it. So remember our way to get pre-contemplators is just to simply educate them about the benefits. Contemplators, we get them to educate them about the benefits to them, right? Um, like getting someone to believe in general that smoking is bad for people right, is a way to get a pre-contemplator to become a contemplator. But getting a contemplator to be a preparer, we make them believe, you know, how quitting smoking can benefit their lives specifically, right? Um, imagine how much money you're going to save, right? What could that do for you? Uh, imagine, like, what it could be like, you know, to not get winded by going up a single flight of stairs. Um, preparers, people who are in the preparation stage. Uh, this is always fun. Uh, I like this one down here. Imagine having like a great start. So this is somebody who's thinking about changing, right? They're thinking about engaging in exercise like regularly, but they're like, Ugh. they're nervous, right? Um, and so it's like, hey, I want you to imagine like how you're going to feel. Um, guess what? You should be imagining yourself super sore. <laughs> Uh, I love to be very realistic about this. Like, hey, I want you to be aware. Like, first time we work together, you are going to be crazy sore out of your mind afterwards, which is why we're going to go pretty gentle in the beginning. Um, but that's a great start. I want you to imagine, like, that soreness is your, you know, that's a sign that you put the effort in. And guess what? A week from that first initial soreness, it's going to drop like crazy. So I want you to imagine accurately the first week and how sore you're going to be but I want you to remember what I'm telling you right now. Second week, it's going to be drastically better. Um, and then like, you know, if we can just get them to do that, guess what? That second week, they start feeling so much better. And they're like, you were right. I imagined it. And it's true. And it's like, yeah, it's true because, you know, physiology and stuff, but that's great, right? Like that, that accurately. This is also, I'll give you an example of how I use this on you guys all the freaking time. Um, I say this a lot. Uh, where I say, I'll often be telling like a story, I'll tell like something physiological or tell you guys something. And it's like, I want you to imagine this moment. I want you to remember this moment in nine months when you're out there training your client, you're like, ah, 
Brad told me that this was going to happen, right? I say that a lot. I use that as an example all the time. Uh, and that's an example of like, you know, it's a, it's not exactly like going through an entire imagery exercise, but that is using imagery. Um, and, and it is totally true. Uh, you're going to have that first client who doesn't show up on time and then they're going to beg you not to charge them. Trust me, this is a true thing. And I want you to remember this moment. <laughs> I say it all the time. Uh, action is another one, right? Action is clients who are, you know, they're, they're taking some specific actions. They just haven't been able to maintain it. This is where, uh, you know, imagine the daily grind, putting it in like a journal, right? And imagine like accomplishing specific tasks. This is where I often give my clients like a task list to achieve. And it's like, let's create some short-term goals. Um, and I want you to imagine achieving those goals consistently, right? Uh, we could do 10 consecutive push-ups. I want you to double that. Imagine in four weeks when you can, you know, double or triple that, right? Uh, or imagine like what the next routine is going to look like, right? I often will be working with a client. Let's say I'm moving through like a month of stabilization. Let's say it's January, right? Uh, and it's like, hey, so, you know, uh, I will lay it out in the very beginning when I'm like selling this person on personal training. I'll say, hey, so we're for this month, we are going to work on, um, we are going to work on, uh, you know, stabilization. I want to get your form really good. I want to get you uh, more effective at exercising, um, right? And then, um, next month, we're going to move you into like developing your endurance. Month after that, we're going to develop uh, like your muscle building capabilities, right? So I'm describing in the first initial session, like session, where we are going over the next like three to six month period, right? Um, and then in that first month, I'm going to continually be referencing what's happening next month. And that way they, they are thinking about it every single time. And it's like, all right, we're doing great. Like you're keeping this up every couple of weeks. Now in a couple of weeks, I want you to imagine like, you know, when we're doing like all this endurance stuff, how we're going to evolve this routine. Right. So we sort of focus on the daily grind. Right. Uh, and we focus on like the, the next routine and, and like where it's going. And then clients who are in the maintenance phase, you've heard me say this a million times, imagine the next level, right? Um, hey, you've mastered like exercising regularly. You ever think about doing a bodybuilding competition? Right? You ever think about running a marathon? You ever think about like inspiring others and maybe becoming like a group exercise instructor? Um, I am proud to say, uh, aside from being like a Sochi teacher and obviously like pumping out tons of current personal trainers out there in the world. Uh, in my career, I have inspired uh, three people, two people who have become personal trainers and one who became a Pilates instructor. Um, and they were just clients. These are not people who, you know, were, came to me to become like, you know, these aren't people who like were Sochi students becoming personal trainers. These are people who were just clients. And they got so passionate about fitness. They decided they wanted to like share it with others. Um, love that. <laughs> that's the next level, right? They're never going to fall back into old habits um, if they are focused on the future, right? We don't have time. <laughs> like I'm busy inspiring others, right? Um, so hopefully that's fun and motivating. Uh, hopefully that kind of um, brought you an idea of like how imagery can be this really fun tool uh, in your toolbox. I like to do it through stories. Um, I like to do it through anecdotes uh, and, and things like that. Um, you're going to have your own techniques uh, that you're going to find effective and, and how to use imagery and stuff. So um, hopefully you're fired up about it. Hopefully you can use this in your own life. You know, I imagery is something that I am not, I don't see myself as like naturally gifted at it, um, but it is something that I, I do enjoy doing. Um, you know, it is a, a very fun technique that can be implemented in a million different ways. It doesn't just have to be you know, sit down and, and meditate and imagine something, right? It doesn't have to be that version. Although if that's the version that works really well for you, do it. That's great, right? Um, yeah, questions, comments, concerns? Andres, I know you're driving, but like uh, Kenny, Dalen, you guys feeling good? Yeah, good to go. Awesome. You feel yep. like uh, you feel like Phil Knight getting ready to do all this stuff? <laughs> Um, Phil Knight or, uh, friggin', uh, um, God, there's so many like famous coaches. I, we were just talking about Tony Dungy the other night. He was a good example of using imagery like crazy. Oh, you're talking about Bobby Knight. They used to be Indiana coach. Bobby Knight is another one, right? No, I mean, just Phil, Phil, I mean, you know, he's the, he's the CEO of Nike and stuff, but he talks a lot about like, imagery. oh yeah. Um, he talks about using it a lot. Bill Simmons. He was another one. Big imagery guy. 
Um, I, I, you know, it's funny. My parents, uh, my parents got me the most amazing, like Christmas gift. Uh, when I was back home, they got an anonymous book. They went to a bookstore and it was like, there it's like a paper cover. And then like, it was like this book and it gives like a general description. It wasn't like what it was actually about. Uh, and then like I unwrapped it, it was Bill Simmons. I was like, hell yeah, former Seattle Sonic. <laughs> My parents nailed it. <laughs> and his biography is cool, man. He's a fascinating guy. Um, loved imagery. So, uh, all right, that's about all I got for you guys. Um, we got homework three then. So this is our final piece of homework. Uh, is going to be up today uh, covering uh, the final bits of this course. We'll have one more lesson um, on Monday, and then we'll be meeting on Tuesday. Um, so uh, our lesson on Monday is going to be a double PowerPoint. It's going to be about like how to use interpersonal relationships, uh, you know, how to create like social structures that will help our clients adhere to a program. Uh, and then we will also talk about like, you know, how to sort of implement this into your career. Um, so it'll be a little bit less about like the, the final section will be a little bit less about techniques that we use a little bit more about like, you know, how do we market this? How do we, you know, get this into uh, our role as trainers? Uh, and then we'll meet on Tuesday and do like a fun little uh, outdoor workout. I want to take everybody through like a uh, um, uh, more of a hypertrophy style routine. So that'll be kind of fun. A little bit more sore from the Tuesday workout, <laughs> uh, which will be fun. On which day? Uh, Tuesday. We're going to meet Tuesday. Tuesday. So, nine and six again uh, in the same park and stuff. And yeah, that's about all I got for you. See you guys. Uh, see you guys Monday. Have a great weekend, guys.